we had your boy Dawson Knox on the show. He was great on the show. He and uh, he told guy. us about what's his name. Every time Josh slides, somebody has to wear a jock strap. Who was it that wore the jock strap? Dawson you, told Mitch. us to. Who was it? Was that you? That uh, dude. That's me on a regular basis. But, uh, <laughs> uh, Case Keenum. It was hey! Case. <laughs> it was Case. You just okay. doxed him. <laughs> you doxed him. I play. I played Mitch like a fiddle. Let's go. Dawson yeah, wouldn't tell good. us. All right, so we got Mitch Morris on. Really important piece of the Bills offense. And uh, last night, Kyle, myself, and Bo were talking about this on the live stream. Mitch, is center the hardest position to play? Well, I'm, I'm reframing the question because yeah. I think it was a ridiculous question. Let me try. Why don't you ask the question the way so it was? So I was, I, you know, I was a nose guard. I played a lot of zero technique. Uh, we actually played against each other in 2017, Mitch, when you were, I think you were with the Chiefs. Um, but anyway, I was kind of shitting on offensive centers a little bit. I, I banged this drum against with Kelsey a little bit, saying that, you know, while center is probably the most intellectually demanding position, um, you know, you can uh, – it's maybe not as physically demanding. You can slide a little bit. You don't necessarily have a zero nose on you uh, every single week. Um, so, you know, a lot of respect for centers. Just ask him the fucking you, question. Mitch. Wondering if, if you think uh, it's harder to play center or guard, and, uh, you know, if you've ever bumped out to guard and what that was like. Uh, there's no way they could pay me to play anything else at this point in my career. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> dude, I, uh, dude, like, especially tackle guard. Like you said, maybe, like, cerebrally or, you know, like with you know what you got to do to comprehend what's going on. But, like, Dude, whenever you're in base, defense is in base, you're just like, shit. You have a, you have a head up nose. And, uh, yeah, I think you nailed it on the head. Um, wow. There you go. Point I wasn't for expecting this. I had of, y'all's uh, back, man. This I had, hey, hey, hey. Now, listen, dude, I, I know, but I'm not going to lie to you. The first center we – I think the first center we've had on the pod. And uh, and, and he just he, the, drops that. the hammer. Uh, all right. Well, so we've been talking about a lot about some of these zero noses. You just got done playing a guy who's 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 on you some in Christian Wilkins, who's a hell of a player. You guys were sh- scuffling up a little bit. Uh, we also watched uh, what's his name this weekend, Dexter Lawrence. Dexter Lawrence, just, yep. Just change a game. Uh, like, yeah. what makes? I mean, I feel like there's fewer really good guys who can zero up these days in the NFL. Um, what's it like playing a, when you run across a guy who can line up in a zero and just walk somebody back? What's that like? Yeah, it's a nightmare. Um, but I, you know, it's it's you, you have these guys, especially in like third downs, who play these zero noses, and it can be really difficult because they almost have a you know two three way go, right. or you know they're you're really getting they, they do a good job of getting on the field, picking the guards, yeah, really causing havoc. I feel like in the last few years, really making an emphasis on disrupting the middle of the pocket and then just running those ends up the field where the quarterback has nowhere to go. Um, yeah, like you said, I watched Dexter Lawrence too. Man's an animal. Yeah, he's really good um, at those net games was, that you were kind of talking yeah. about, like to the slide side, well, where he's just such a big body and he'll kind of pick the guard in that A-gap. It's like a TE. You're just trying to yeah, get to the guard. Yeah, it's a little inside you know? TE. And then they'll like – teams will run a backer through the other A-gap, and it's, it's really hard. I think it's interesting to watch some of those guys too. Mitch, I'm not sure if you experienced this, but like – They'll back up off the ball a little bit so they can get when they're rushing as a zero tech, so you can kind of get, you know, a little bit more steam. Uh, you're not so far off the ball. So I was kind of wondering, like one thing Jason Kelsey, um, you know, Ryan Khalil, some of those old head centers will do is they'll try to get on those guys early um, or else, you know, with their offhand, their snap, their non snapping hand. Uh, you know, go for like the helmet punch. Is that you got any tricks like that up your sleeve? I know you, you, you know give out his about. tricks. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, like you said, it, it really is difficult at times when you when when the D tackle or the nose guard takes a few steps back, not only getting a full head of steam, but uh, you know they can kind of get into a move to take away your offhand. Right. Um, you know you, you want to get on these guys, especially these big, powerful dudes, as quick as possible. But a guy like Dexter Lawrence, even Christian Wilkins, I mean, they do a really good job of morphing their game into well these secondary moves that they yeah. have like i think dex lawrence is you know chop or that hunt move yeah he's got that to, rip he'll get in there and then pull it out and it's it's gnarly yeah. so i mean it's just uh i have a lot of admiration for a lot of guys in this league um <clears throat> especially just kind of how that nose guard and that three techniques morphing into uh what it is now all right so uh your wife said that you she wished you would defend her honor the way you defended josh allen's honor <laughs> uh she, does she realize it's complicated you know that's the quarterback 
Yeah, she she understands. We we had a chat about it. Um, <laughs> She's the quarterback uh, of your household, though, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. No. And if she ever put me in that position, we'd have a chat. But uh, <laughs> you know, it, it's just football. It's nature of the beast. Tempers flare. The Holy Spirit takes over when you when you least expect it. Um, it was one of those things that it happened and then uh, after, I mean, dissipated just as quickly as it right. came on. Yeah, we know how that uh, goes. I mean, you continue the game. You're, you might be expecting a little chippiness here or there just because you guys went through it. But um, we had a chat after the game, very amicable. Uh, you understand the kind of player he is. He's a competitive right. dude, pushes the boundaries, and uh, you have to respect him. A little bit it. of a talk. He's always talking. I always watch Christian Wilkins. Yeah. He's always trying to wind dudes up. The funniest thing to me is, like, watching him and Josh in a shoving match. They're kind of like <laughs> – they're kind of the same yeah. fucking size. Josh almost. looks like a fucking D end out there. <laughs> yeah, he. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I didn't see the beginning part. I just saw it turn around, and then you know, Christian was kind of giving Josh the business. Yeah, that's a ride or die guy Josh, right there. Didn't even see the whole thing. Josh had thrown his set himself at it. So, uh, you know, Josh is competitive as they come, and we love him for it. We're gonna uh, do what we can to help him out whenever, any way we can, and um, you know, it, it, you know, those things happen. Yeah. Let me no ask question. you something yeah, no about that little scuffle and you know, not not to make too much of it, but you know, it was kind of far downfield. I saw you, you know, you turn, you ran down there, and then I don't think people realize how exhausting those little those are tires. Those little uh <laughs> you know, those little scuffles are because you're there's a lot of bodies, <laughs> you know, you're you're that's the thing about like fighting in practice. That's the too. thing about like, fighting in practice. It's it's never the thing worth about it. fighting a game, it's the thing about celebrating turnovers yeah. all the way down the end zone on defense. I never did that bullshit. Because yeah. I had to go back and play. It's exhausting. Yeah. Um, I want to talk about Jalen Phillips, man. You know, like you guys just saw this group. I, I He really stands out to me on tape. I mean, I just really admire his game and the way he moves around. He can win over the guard. He can win on the edge. He's made a couple big plays against you all in the cor- over the course of the season this year. What do you guys, when you get in, a, in an offensive line room, when you talk about Jalen Phillips, what do you guys talk about? Yeah, like you said, a uh, very multiple guy, you know, can can be uh, disruptive not only inside but outside. Really understands that <clears throat> defense that they run, very good at creating lanes for others and also capitalizing on one-on-one matchups. Like you said, uh, I think just how he's progressed, I think this is year two for him. Yeah. Uh, we have nothing but uh, uh, respect for that dude. And, we, I, you know, like you said, I think he's going to be a hell of a player come, you know, just in the foreseeable future. Uh, he, he's just got all the intangibles and the tangibles. So you you were in Kansas City, like you've blocked for Patrick Mahomes, you blocked for for Josh Allen. Who's the tougher guy to predict where he is in the pocket? You know, because I know that like it's when when we used to play mobile quarterbacks, it's like in one in some ways they can bail y'all out, but in some ways it can be like y'all have no idea where Josh is is drifting to or Patrick might be going, and that's what mm-hmm. makes them great. But sometimes it can make it harder. Who was harder to predict uh, geographically? Yeah, I mean, you live by the sword, you die by the sword, right? Like, so the, those dudes bail us out more than than anything. So, like, nine out of ten times they bail us out, and there's one time you might run into your guy. Um, yeah, I, I've just had more time on task with Josh, to be honest. Like, I had one year with Pat. Yeah. Um, you just, I mean, both those guys, they're just clocking, my, you know, feet, meters, mm-hmm. just in and out of the pocket. Uh, I mean, to a point where you just kind of sit there sometimes when I'm out of pocket and you're like, that's, that's, that's on you, pal. You yeah. Can take off yeah. And do your thing. But uh, I, I think for me, um, I'll probably say Pat moves yeah. a little bit more in and out. I mean, he'll just take off and then really uh, make those plays outside pocket. But, but Josh is also, you know, sometimes you have no idea where the hell he is or you just, your guy kind of runs into him and, uh, you know, that's part that's what makes Josh so great, and you don't want him to change. Yeah. yeah. No, no, yeah, you don't want to coach him out of that. Uh, Hell no. And Patrick, Hell he, no. Patrick will set it like 11 yards. Like, yeah. he'll just drift back. I want to take a good look, you know. Uh, <laughs> and, and I know as an edge rusher, sometimes, like, a tackle will get beat, and they'll be like, ah, oh, tackle just got smoked. I'm like, not really. Yeah. And just ran straight up field. Um, so it's hard on y'all, man. Like, But like you said, that's what makes them great, too. Um how about Josh sliding? This was a big topic. We had your boy Dawson Knox on the show. He was great on the show. He and uh, he told guy. us about what's his name. Every time Josh slides, somebody has to wear a jock strap. Who was it that wore the jock I strap? It was Dawson you, told Mitch. us to. Who was it? Was that you? That uh, dude. That's me on a regular basis. But, uh, <laughs> uh, Case Keenum. It was hey! Case. <laughs> it was Case. You just okay. doxed him. <laughs> you doxed him. I play. I played Mitch like a fiddle. Let's go. Dawson yeah, wouldn't tell yeah. us. 
Dawson, would, he was protecting Case. Yeah. That's my dog. Well, I, listen, I'm too old to care. Case, uh, <laughs> first of all, beautiful soul. I know you, you, he's you've the had best. time with Case. He's the best. He's just not only he's a glue guy in the locker room, real uh, just no one has a, a, anything bad to say about Case. Yeah. Drip and king of the week. he'll put himself out there. I mean, yeah. he'll put himself out there in that uh, – it's a beautiful thing to see. It's a beautiful yeah. thing to see. That's big for morale. Talk about a glue guy. I think right we've there. both seen Case Keenum in a jock strap. <laughs> um, yes. Okay, so how, how how have you guys kind of come together um, since Demar's injury, and like, what was that night like? I know you were one of the people, evidently, that spoke up and was like, "Guys, you know, um, unprecedented." We were sitting here watching it. I feel like we get so desensitized to situations like that, but that was different. You know, like last night Gage went down. I and I hate saying this, but I don't think if Demar hadn't got hurt a couple of weeks ago that we wouldn't have that we would have been as somber as we were watching the Gage injury. Scary because as fuck. usually it's like, okay, cart the guy off, he's probably okay. Like we've been desensitized. But that was different. How quickly did you know it was different? Well, I mean yeah, like you said, it is the nature of the beast. You, we are desensitized to a point. You can also see how the trainers rea- react, um, how the guys on the ground, yeah. uh, what you know, what it is. Um, if it's kind of an orthopedic thing, or a knee or something, you you understand that uh, it's, as it flows. We've just come off of a drive uh, where we had to kick a field goal, kind of decompressing, understanding. They're also where they're going. They're driving down the field. All right, what's going to look like? It's going to be ten to three, fourteen to three. And then you realize that more and more people are uh, are kind of attending to him. Uh, the gravity of the situation increases, so you get off the off the bench, and then um, then you just see what you see, which I think is, you know we don't need to belabor anymore. Which was just kind of uh, like you said, an, an unprecedented thing that no one's really you know we're we're all kind of writing the script as we went. Um, I think it was one of the most just perspective driven things that yeah. I've ever been around. Like you're immediately back to reality, both teams. Uh, it was it, the best of football came out because I've never felt safer being a football player, just seeing how uh, the training staff, the red hat, like it was just, everyone had their tasks and everyone yeah. understood what to do. Um, but it was shocking. I mean, it was just the, you, 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 you see it in movies, you, you see everyone using the AED and all that stuff, but until you kind of go through it yourself, you don't understand how you're going to react. Um, also, just there's different, you know, different position groups have different relationships. And it's, it's not a bad thing, but, you know, guys are feeling this differently. The defense was feeling this in a way that this is one of their brothers. Um, you know, this is a teammate for the offense. You know, certain guys were just, un, you know, inconsolable. Uh, so I, I think it was great to be able to go back to the locker room, kind of have your feelings, um, be able to be there with your teammates and, you um, you know, it was a, it was kind of one of those group things. It was very fluid, uh, but there was no point where the, the whole thing with the NFL saying like you have five minutes to play. Yeah, that was one of those things that we just we were just like let's take five minutes, maybe more so just to have more time to figure out what to do. So that wasn't uh, an NFL directive. Like you guys don't think it came down that I mean, way? It wasn't like I, I I didn't feel like it was yeah. a five minute or else kind of deal. Yeah. it was like a five minutes. If we, you know, if it, it seems like if we need more time, cool. Yeah. But at the, during the five minutes, so the coaches were kind of, you know, figuring, hashing things out. The referees were emotional. Yeah. Um, it was, it was, uh, it was a trying time, emotionally taxing, and, um, you know, but the cool thing is to see Demar, uh, really kind of bounce back, and uh, his presence is, is, it's been really cool to see. Around. Yeah, man, that whole week, and I can't even imagine, but I don't know the kid at all. And I think what, what you said the best of football was like people getting to learn about him and just what a great kid he seems to be and all he's done and said. Like he just – all the interviews that people were bringing up, I was like, man, I'd love to play with a guy like that. Yeah. And I just – it's a shame that it takes something like that to learn more about one of the great men we have in our league. And I hope that like we, we focus more on the humanity of it, like the people – that are playing the game because he, he just seems like a great kid. And I just remember the whole week I'd go to sleep and I would be having a dream that like, you know, DeMar was out of the hospital or something. Like I was really focused in on it. I don't even know the kid. Like I was waking up, checking my phone the first night. And I'll be honest, I, I did not have a positive outlook on where I thought it went. As you got those updates through the week, y'all had to be just ecstatic, like to hear, oh, ne- neurologically intact. You know, he, I heard he sat up 
you know, yeah. the, one of the first couple nights and like, you know, reach for the tube or whatever. And just hearing that was like, oh my God, like, I cannot believe this guy's going to come out of this thing relatively unscathed. Um, how great was it to see him in person? Have you seen him in person? And, yeah. uh, and, and what, a, what a lift that gives you guys. Like you said, we were all kind of, uh, I think the team did a really good job of giving us the flow of information just a little bit before it got out to the public, which yeah. was uh, fair to the guys. Um, I think through the media, through the NFL, through everything, I, this was just handled so beautifully. Um, it, it, was, it was really kind of like a, it was, it was a nice little sigh of relief to see that, uh, you know, something so paramount was handled so well. Seeing Damar every day, we kind of had a team meeting with a Zoom call with either you know, his parents, which was very powerful, uh, the medical staff, and then one day he came on, and he was still very, you know, it was, you know, it was 96 hours after you know, yeah, after the injury, very uh, tired, but it, it was one of those very, you could feel the energy kind of slam into the room, right, like, like the blood flow. It was, it was just kind of one of those. Uh, it was one of those surreal moments you'll never forget. But like you said, uh, well, I think the thing that we didn't realize was the emotional letdown of that. We had all this pent yeah. up. And then once this all subsided, everyone felt it differently. Everyone kind of processed this differently. And I know that after that New England game, that locker room was just exhausted. Yeah. And, uh, but like you said, it's, it's, it's been cool to see him around even sporadically just kind of showing face. So it's good for the guy. Was it hard to go back out there? Like a lot of people. And I, I kind of, I imagine that I'd be able to, to go back out and hit people and like do what we do because of part of, part of the nature of the injury was so rare. Yeah. Like it, it didn't seem like the football injuries I've seen before, but I also know that some guys probably, as you alluded to compartmentalize it differently. And maybe it was hard to go out and play on Sunday against uh, the Pats, the the kick returns were crazy. It was almost scripted. It was beautiful. Yeah. Um, but like, how hard was it to take the field, or was it hard at all? That's a good question. I think it depended on the position group. It depended on um, the individual. You don't know how it's going to manifest itself in someone. Um, just kind of how you how you mentally deal with it. Coach did a really good job of putting us in a position to actually be in pads for individual and a few things on like a Wednesday, yeah. Thursday That's deal, yeah. just to have a controlled environment. Yeah. Uh, have, and it was all very structured. Like also if someone is having a moment where they're, they're not, you know, not feeling like they're into it, take a step back. Oh, that's interesting. It's yeah. one of those very fluid deals. That's kind but of that was really great. You, you know, that was really great because that's, we were able yeah. to, uh, a lot of guys get those first few pops in right. and that not be on Sunday. That's interesting, man. I mean, just like you go from being an NFL head coach and game planning to your right. crisis managing. Yeah. And I think like not only the trainers, but also McDermott deserves credit. And like, obviously so, the guys in the locker room well, deserve a lot of credit. there's a very human aspect that kind of shows itself from, you know, the yeah. coaches in this scenario. And, but you don't get you to know, see a lot. Treating guys like men and, yeah. uh, you know, with emotion. Yeah. It's, it's kind of nice. But it is interesting, Mitch, because you guys are, you know, the Bengals here in the playoffs. And obviously that game wasn't, you know, it wasn't completed. And now here you are a couple weeks later. Playing them on the, you know, a huge stage, and what's that like? Like, are you? I don't know. It just seems so unprecedented, you know. Yeah, I, I would say the scope of it all hasn't quite set in yet. We're just kind of getting into the normal weekly routine. Um, you know, we understand that the Bengals just are so, such a complete team. Yeah. We only had like one drive on offense, eleven plays, and yeah. then they were having the third drive of the game when this all went down. Um, it felt it felt like it was going to be a great competitive just brawl. Yeah, and uh, one of those just a good football game, and and uh, it'll be interesting to see how everyone takes the field, especially because this was you know we we had this shared experience with these two teams. Yeah. Like I said, uh, football when when that was going down was the last thing on our minds. We shared moments with this other team um, that were profound, and uh, you know I think that'll that'll play itself out within the first play or even like pre-game you know i think for me the most yeah. nerve-wracking part of football is the national anthem yeah, yeah. just because the anticipation yeah. of the whole thing but once you get into the flow of it it's exactly. football again. yeah um so it, it, that's a great question yeah. uh, I, I think it'll play itself out as a i think as on, soon but... as dj reader you can smell his breath i think <laughs> i think it's gonna be i think it's on no, uh another <laughs> exceptional football player yeah. he is a good football player man they got some good players up front 
Um, what do you see when you look at this front seven? I think guys who play through the whistle, to say the least, yeah. guys who make a lot of plays by just chasing the ball, um, fundamentally sound, and just, I mean, the interior guys are some big, big dudes. Mm. Uh, edge rushers, of course, with uh, 91 and 94, are, are, they're going to get after the quarterback. And they're going to bend the edge. Yeah. Uh, Hendricks and Hubbard. So Pretty physical be, linebackers, too. And yep. Logan Wilson. So and very that, physical linebackers. And yeah. the back end. The back end comes downhill. Like, they actually get involved in the run game, which is something you don't see with uh, every defensive back group. Not to throw shade <laughs> at in, some of the DBs in our great league. Last um, night with the Bucks. Von Bell and those guys, they get after it. So, that's going to be awesome. Um, the neutral site thing's kind of – it's a weird thing. Like, you know, say you guys win, you got to play, uh, isn't it, Kansas City and, and, what, Atlanta? You guys have done some crazy travel shit this yeah. year. Yeah, it's – it's uh, our season has had its ebbs and flows, to say the least, uh, with traveling and, and then just kind of personal stuff going on and, and on the team. Um when we were on the field, when when uh, Demar went down and all that stuff, we realized that we didn't care if it was a forfeit. We didn't care what the ramifications were, um, because it was bigger than football. Yeah. And when you say that, you have to mean it. Yeah. And, oh yeah. Uh, and yeah. It's, and and so now, if if that's the case, it may be. We, you know, we we weren't able to fight for the one seed. We we really didn't give a shit. Yeah. It just yeah. It was it was so much bigger than football at the time. And and uh, if we're fortunate enough to get to that position to play Kansas City. It'll just be kind of another chapter in the book, and we understand how we got there, and we'll just go with the flow. How nice is it when you go on the road sometimes, and just in general, even being at home, like to have Bills Mafia, because I feel like they show up everywhere. Like I remember when I played for the Eagles, this was the first time in my career. You know, I was in St. Louis for a long time, Mizzou guy. So uh, we we we. Uh, We'd, we'd go on the road. We didn't have that many fans there. In Philly, we went to play the Chargers, and they had to go on silent count. Yeah, exactly. You know, um, what's it like having those guys when you take the field anywhere in the country? You, you definitely feel it, right? I think the presence of a, of a good fan base can be overlooked sometimes. And, uh, you know, it's one of those things that you can often take for granted until you're on the reciprocating end or the, or the other end of it. Um, yeah, I can't imagine you in a silent account at home, like yeah. you said. Like, that's just a nightmare <laughs> situation. So, uh, you know, they've also been such a, like a spearhead for us just being able to uh, kind of go with the flow of this season. Yeah. You know, the City of Good Neighbors is definitely – it definitely showed out this year, whether it's removing snow or just being there for – Dawson was telling us team. about that. Yeah, yeah he said yeah, that. Dude, some guys were, you, were you buried? I was – yeah, I was buried. Um, but – I, we, the dude who bailed me out was on a front loader, came in like a superhero. <laughs> wow. and just, yeah. That's the only thing that could move the snow. Like anyway, like, you know, you see the the trucks that have the the thing on the front, they were getting stuck. So like these tractors were just bailing everyone out. I don't think I've ever seen a fan base make a bigger play than getting these guys to the plane that week. That I mean, sweet. it was just insane. Like guys people were, were just stepping up. It was like a truly a yeah. college town. It felt uh, like to me. You know, the community in Buffalo, it's a city, but, it, you know, like Green Bay's kind of got this little vibe about it. And the same thing, the community in Buffalo has to be crazy. Just just everybody's on the same team. Yeah, it was uh, it, it was it was just uh, you can't put into words how cool it was. It was yeah. cool shit, dude. That's just awesome. Like, uh, you know, yeah, the, it's it's been fun. But uh, guys, I just want to tell you that I've been able, I think, fortunate to play both you guys. I remember 2017 vividly. You beat my ass on that. I was blocking back on a play action pass. You smoked uh, Alex. He loves and, this. Uh, Me? <laughs> yeah. yeah oh, do. cool. He loves this. He loves compliments. I thought you were talking yeah. to Chris. Thanks, man. No, I, I didn't. Like if it was Chris. a passing play, I was probably on the sideline. <laughs> I got <laughs> Mitch. It was, a, it was a play action. It was a counter pass. Oh, yeah. Cool. Yeah. And and then, of course, Chris uh, loved the way you played. Thanks, bro. Years. Oh, I yeah, appreciate that, man. Good. Thank the you green light, much. the green light's one of the one of the best in the bit. The yeah, we love that, bro. We love that. We love, hey, <laughs> hey, and it's all respect your way, bro. We've really enjoyed watching you play. We know how important you are to that team. Yeah. Even if you want to downplay the importance of a center. No, no, uh, no. I mean, and, I, was, I was talking shit earlier, but the center is really the, the captain of the. <laughs> he's a cap. The, the, the cap. Uh, the offensive line. Yeah. Exactly. Here's 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 my one last question for you. It's a little bit off the board. Mike Kafka. Yeah, he was a guy that 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 I think you crossed paths with with in Kansas yeah. City. Is that true? He, his true. name is being just circulating in the in the head coaching conversation. What can you tell us about the kind of guy he is? 
and how you think he'd project. Yeah, I feel my my time with Casco was so limited. He had he had just yeah. become the uh, the quarterback coach with Pat that year. He's just QB but coach. A guy right? who's really integrated with the group. It's more of a uh, you know, it's it's not so much a delegating role as it is just kind of like let's do this together. Yeah. Um, figure this the best way out. Let's have a fluid conversation, all that stuff. So. I, I just love to see guys that you, you you know put in the work, and especially a young dude like that who's had such great success, but's earned it, earned right. the right to do it. Um, if he gets the opportunity, I know he'll roll with it. And, Is there a superstar coach under the radar in Buffalo that doesn't get enough credit? Oh man, um, yeah, I dude. If I but if I start this, then then, then, then sure you might I'm lose one of them. Yeah, you, you might we, lose we, one we, of them. We have we have plenty of dudes. I think our receivers coach Chad Hall. Is a is a stud, and the guys love him so much. Yeah, he just, yep. he's able to, um, you know. Sometimes coaching any position group, but especially receivers, you have so many different personalities. Yes. Yeah, you're almost managing. Uh, it's a little bit yeah. of a he a, coaching. He does such a good job of not only doing that, but also getting these guys just playing their nuts off. So it, it's a, he's he's a great coach. and Cro- and Cromer's of, Cromer's your guy, right? Cromer's the dude. Yeah, he's, he's a he's a kick ass dude. Yeah, uh, another guy who you feel like you can have this. Um, when you know, when you're sitting in the cafeteria, you're rarely gonna talk about football. It's gonna yeah, be about life. Yeah. And when football comes about, it's cool and and more of a give and take. Uh, we have an older room. It's not like a super old room, but the oldest room is like yeah. you know, the AARP club and in our O line. We got <laughs> yeah. four or five yeah. guys. <laughs> well, Saffold's old now. That was yeah. my young guy, man. Dude, Saffold, like you see a Saff, who's just uh, who's a pain the season, in the ass, uh, season man. vet. Load. He's a great guy. We love we love Saffold. Tell Saffold we said we said what's up, and tell Cromer I said hi because he used to take care of my brother at his last daycare stop. So uh, I will. So I, will uh, listen, man. I really appreciate you for having me on. It is a treat. We appreciate you coming on, man. Yeah, Good luck this week, bro. Go Bills. Yeah, enjoy the playoffs. Listen to the full podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and other podcast streaming platforms. Uh, wherever you want to get the podcast, you can get the podcast. Pretty simple. New episodes every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Don't forget to like and subscribe for more content. Podcasts get pretty wild. This is real tame.